Well, welcome to this video and I'm going to present information from the Journal of Pediatrics. And what this is saying is that we've got it wrong in the early part of the pandemic. So it was kind of taken as, as read really for quite some time that children were not going to take the infection home and infect their parents and their grandparents. I'm now going to give evidence that that is wrong. Children could be a significant driver of infection. And the reason I'm concerned about this is with schools going back and universities going back, I believe that children can spread the infection significantly to older people, to their parents, their grandparents, and be a significant driver of infection. And I'm going to give evidence that children have a high viral load and shed large amounts of virus in this paper, and therefore can potentially take it back to their households. So we're going to be talking about that. So the bottom line of this paper is, I believe there could be a lot of spread of infection in children with children taking it to other members of the community. That's the main point of this paper. And the other point that this paper comes up with, it talks about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Now, we still don't know why some children get this severe multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Thankfully, virtually all children, the vast majority of children, get a very mild illness or, or indeed asymptomatic illness. But they're still infectious with mild or asymptomatic illness. That, that, that's information in this paper as well. But this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, we haven't really known why some children get it and other children don't. Well, there's mounting circumstantial evidence from this, evidence from this paper in the Journal of Pediatrics that if a child is exposed to several viral infections at once, as well as the SARS coronavirus too, so other viruses, other respiratory viruses, which are around at the same time, if they get those other viruses at the same time as they get the SARS coronavirus type 2, then they're probably more likely, there's evidence that there's more, they're more likely to get this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, of course, which is so dangerous. And that's another concern because when children go back to school, it's not just the the, 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 the COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2, we have to worry about. It's all the other viruses that are around as well. And it looks like if children get a, several viruses at the same time, they're more likely to get these severe complications. So that, that's, what this, this, that's what this video is about. Um, but do stick with me, otherwise I'll get lonely. Now, um, previous videos on children and infection that we've looked at, this one we looked at from the uh, Centre for Disease Control recently. And that showed that children have viral loads as high as adults. And indeed that children under five have higher viral loads than adults. So why shouldn't they be shedding this virus? It all makes sense. It's completely consistent with this new paper here. Pediatric SARS coronavirus 2 clinical presentation, infectivity and immune responses. So the CDC work, the Centre for Disease Control, is essentially consistent with this. And that, that's the other reason that my thinking has become more and more um, sort of... Um, I've become more and more certain of this conclusion now. I believe in this conclusion more and more because multiple collaborations mean that we're much more likely to be getting towards the uh, the absolute truth of the matter. And this comes from data from the Massachusetts General Hospital. So uh, reputable organisation and reputable academics. Now the background that the Massachusetts General Hospital talk about Asymptomatic carriers in children, including children, can spread infection and carry the virus into their households. Now, they are now stating this, right? So I think we can basically state this as fact now. Asymptomatic carriers and asymptomatic children can spread the virus to their households. So can children infect their whole household? Yes. Children are spreading the virus to their households. That is now accepted in this paper. Now, the objectives of this particular study, a potential role children play in the coronavirus infectious disease 2019 pandemic. So how are children contributing to this pandemic, as it were, and the factors that drive severe illness in children? So there's two things, really, that we're looking at. The first is the role of children as infection drivers, infecting other people. And the second is why do some children get really quite sick and and indeed, a very, very small minority of children are at risk of death. So that's what it's set out to look at. So good idea. Now, um, 
The study design, they actually included young people up to the age of 22, who of course aren't children, but that, that's who they included in this group. So it's children and young people they've included with suspected infection, presenting to urgent care clinics or being hospitalised. So these are hospitalised children in Massachusetts. Uh, for confirmed or suspected SARS coronavirus 2 infection, that's why they were admitted. Or some were admitted without knowing whether they'd had SARS coronavirus 2 infection, the COVID-19. Um, but some were admitted with suspected multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Now, when they were enrolled, lots of data was taken. So this was good. So they had the nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal antigen swabs and blood specimens taken for the antibodies as well. And as well as just testing for whether the virus was there or not, they did quantitative studies for viral load, how much virus was being shed. As we've said, the serology, which tests for the antibodies. The immunoglobulins that show infection has recently occurred. Now, they also tested for ACE2 RNA levels. Now, what, what this group did was, as well as the children in the actual cohort group, they actually took information from other groups of people in the hospital. So uh, they took information from children attending uh, outpatient departments, not necessarily for COVID-19 related illness, for other things, but they took swabs from them and they checked for the amount of uh, ACE2 RNA. Now, that's getting a bit complicated. Let's just work out what it means. So the ACE2 is the angiotensin 2 receptor, which is how the virus gets into the cell. And they were checking for the RNA levels. Now, there's, there's a dogma in, uh, in biology. It's called DNA uh, makes RNA uh, makes protein. So that, that's kind of a, a, a dogma in biology and genetics. So the ACE2 receptors, of course, are made of protein. And the DNA is in the nucleus, so if there's more RNA for the proteins that make up the ACE2 receptor. That means there's more ACE2 receptors being produced. And of course, the cells in the respiratory mucosa are being produced all the time. They're constantly being produced and renewed. So they're looking for the amount of RNA as a proxy for the amount of ACE2 receptors being produced. So that's, that's the information they collected. Now, 192 children in the main part of the study, but as I said, they collected information from other patients and cohorts as well in this study from around about the hospitals. 49 children, 26% were diagnosed with acute SARS coronavirus 2 infection. And as well as that, an additional 18 met the criteria for um, multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children without necessarily being diagnosed at the time for the uh, COVID-19. They were presenting with this. Because of course, the thing about the uh, multi-system inflammatory system of children is it can present late and the child can have got rid of the original viral infection. Now, nasopharyngeal, so that's the bit at the back of the nose, nasopharyngeal viral was highest in children in the first two days of symptoms. So that is definitely true. The first two days of symptoms are the most infectious first two days. So that's pretty useful, important information. Children are most infectious in the first two days of symptoms. So the first day a child complains of any symptoms at all, that is when they are most infectious, therefore most essential to isolate them during that time. Some children carry very high viral loads even before symptoms develop. So again, this is now confirmed. This is more or less, well, this is fact now. Um, before symptoms, pre-symptomatic people can carry very high viral loads. In other words, the virus is multiplying, but the virus is not multiplied to a point where it's high enough to make the person sick. But they can still have very high viral loads, therefore they're shedding it. Viral load in respiratory secretions of children was high, despite mild or asymptomatic conditions. Now, what they did here was they looked at the relatives, um, the other children in the family of children that were diagnosed, and they checked them to see if they were developing the infection. And what they found out, of course, some were developing the infection. And they found out that those that were uh, asymptomatic or had very mild disease 
were still having they still had high viral loads. So again, this means that people without symptoms or very mild illness are going to be infectious. So viral load in respiratory secretions in children was high despite mild or absent symptoms. And they actually found out that the viral load in children was higher than the viral load in adults who were hospitalised with severe disease. Now, what this is saying is that children who had asymptomatic infection or minimally symptomatic infection actually had higher viral loads than adults who were acutely ill. Interesting, children having higher viral loads. Now, to be fair, the adults that they were comparing this to had had the illness for a few days in hospital. Therefore, their immune systems could have got their viral load down. But the team are still saying that children have high viral loads compared to adults. So if they've got high viral loads, why wouldn't they be infectious? Um, now, the age of the child did not affect viral load. Now, this is interesting because the study that we looked at a few days ago, uh, this study here from the Centre for Disease Control, this study was showing that viral loads were highest in young children under the age of five. But this study is saying age of child or young person did not impact on viral load. Now, to be fair, in this study, there wasn't many swabs that they were accurately able to get from children under the age of five. So had they had a big or sample size, they might have found that. But what we can say from this is that children, the child's age doesn't affect viral load. But this doesn't exclude the fact that children under the age of five have higher viral loads, as the Centre for Disease Control said. But th from this, we can see that 10 year olds and five year olds and 15 year olds have equivalent viral loads equal to or greater than adults. And they found younger children had lower ACE2 expression. But we'll, we'll come on to that later on. Young, younger children, what, what they're saying is you, uh, younger children had less of these ACE2 receptors. Uh, for the virus to bind onto in their respiratory tract. But there's actually a contradiction here in this study because children had high viral loads, therefore the virus must have been multiplying somewhere. So I think that might be a bit of a red herring, that one. But they, they did talk about it quite a bit in the paper, so I felt it fair to include it. Uh, we'll talk about that probably later on in a minute. Um, now, source of children's infection. The children in the study, where did they become infected? So 18% did not have a known infected household contact. So 18% did not have a known household contact. So, so in other words, quite a few of them were catching it from other people in the household. And 53% uh, attended grade school. Now, grade school is American for, in, in England, we call that junior school. So 53 of them went to school and therefore were potentially spreading the virus. Sorry, 53%. Uh, this is the, it, it, so grade school is uh, now correct me if I'm wrong um, but I believe that's sort of four to eleven year olds now what about the presentation uh, SARS coronavirus 2 infection and non-COVID-19 related illness presented similarly so the reason there was quite a large cohort but quite a few didn't actually turn out to have SARS coronavirus 2 was you get a very similar presentation with other conditions so children with other viral infections presented in a fairly similar way or children with asthma presented in a similar way as well. But in the positive group, they were able to give some uh, quantification of the clinical symptoms, which is interesting. Uh, only 51% presented with fever. You'd expect it to be higher. So 51% presented with fever. 47% presented with cough. So we can see that fever and cough are the main presenting features in the group that tested positive, but they didn't all have it. So only 51% had fever, only 47% had cough. Congestion, so blocked up noses and things, 35%. Runny nose, 29%. And uh, headaches, 27%. So they, that's interesting quantification of the way that children present. And none of these were significantly different between the two groups. That's between the COVID group and the non-COVID group. In other words, although these symptoms do occur in the COVID group, 
they are fairly non-specific symptoms making it harder to give a clinical diagnosis without testing. This just shows the importance of any of these features merit a test so we can decide whether these features are caused by something else or whether they're caused by COVID-19 therefore require isolation. But the ones that were significantly different statistically were the uh, anosmia, the loss of smell. Now 20% had anosmia, lower than you would expect perhaps, and 35% had a sore throat. So these were significantly different from the people that didn't have the, uh, the coronavirus infection. So again, testing for the anosmia, the loss of smell, and the sore throat having a high index of suspicion, it shows that's important. Now, none of the studies I've read, either for this Massachusetts study or the study for, from the Center for Disease Control, have included a rash. So I've included this really in parenthesis because I don't understand it. The COVID-19 symptom tracker app in the UK is showing that up to 20% of cases have a rash. And yet nowhere in the Massachusetts study and nowhere in the Centre for Disease Control study is, is a rash described. Now, in fact, the COVID-19 symptom tracker app say that a rash can be the only clinical feature, albeit in a minority of cases, but it can be the only clinical feature. So I'm bemused as to why the Centre for Disease Control in the United States and the, uh, the Massachusetts study that we're talking about here from the Journal of Paediatrics don't discuss a rash when it can occur, according to the UK data, in one in five of people that are infected. I have no more information than that. All I can do is recognise the paradox. I can't come to a conclusion because I have no more information. But that's um, strange. Strange. I suspect the, uh, the American clinicians don't count it as a significant factor because I can't imagine that you get a rash in 20% in the UK and 0% in, in the US. I just can't imagine that at all. So I assume it's a documentation recording thing, but... The COVID symptom tracker rat makes it clear that rash is an important clinical feature, but none of these studies mention it. So more, 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 to, uh, more to clarify there. Conclusions of this Massachusetts study. Children may be a potential source of contagion in the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic. There you go. They're infection drivers. This contradicts previous reports. Children less likely to be index case within the household. In other words, the index case, the case that brings it into the household. So they admit this contradicts earlier findings. In other words, children can be the index case in a household. They can bring it in to the household. That can happen, contradicting previous work. Children with high viral loads and non-specific symptoms, including runny nose and cough, can likely transmit SARS coronavirus to as easily as other respiratory viruses spread by respiratory droplets, such as the common cold. So children even if they're asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, can spread this infection just as easily as an influenza or a common cold. And of course, children have always been known to be classic spreaders of influenza and common cold. So this is just the same. So why on earth we've been around the houses saying that children aren't infectious when patently they are? And uh, to be fair, I've been saying all along that, that I believe they would be. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's a form of wishful thinking, really. But here we've got the data. They're just as uh, they can spread SARS coronavirus too, just like any other virus. Uh, if schools were to reopen fully, without necessary precautions, it is likely that children will play a larger role in this pandemic. This is this is pretty definitive stuff here from the Massachusetts study. Potential transmission between children and families should be considered when designing strategies to mitigate the pandemic. And in other words, there's going to be a lot more cases if we don't realise that children are infection drivers. And this is in spite of children getting mild or lack of symptoms. So they're still spreading the infection, whether they're minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. And then that's basically the main part of this. <coughs> but then they go on and discuss this multisystem inflammatory syndrome. So we'll go on and do it now. 
um, because this is concerning for the children themselves. So what we've looked at so far really is concerning for children spreading it to other diseases, other, other people, spreading the disease to other people. What we're looking at now is uh, important for the health of the individual child. So let's look at that now. Now, um, they hypothesize that uh, ACE2 receptors, which we talk about, which is where the virus gets in, expression in the nasopharynx increases with age. <clears throat> so they're saying that this increases with age. But to me, this doesn't quite make sense because we know that children are infectious equally at all ages. So this study is saying a five-year-old, <clears throat> six-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old, equally infectious, even though they're saying that that the number of ACE2 receptors increases progressively with age. Well, the virus must be multiplying somewhere. So we're not at complete knowledge of this yet. This doesn't make sense. Because if, if, if the ACE2 receptors get more common as children go older, you'd expect older children to have vi higher viral loads, but that's not the case. So there's something missing here. We're not quite, there's a, there's a contradiction here. It doesn't quite make sense at the moment. So I'm not going to dwell on it because we don't understand it. We need more data. But it does talk about the multisystem inflammatory system in children, which is very concerning. Now, um, the IgM and the IgG, the immunoglobulins, these are the antibodies, to the receptor binding domain spike protein were increased in severe multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. So you, put, you might remember, we've done this many times, remember, remember the, uh, the viruses like this. And it's got these, uh, it's got these bits on the end, these spikes on the end. Well, these, um, so this, um, this domain spike, the, the the receptor binding domain spike protein is this, is this bit. It's the bit that binds into the ACE2 receptor. That's that bit. So these children were making antibodies that fit onto the onto here like this. They were making these antibodies. And what they were saying is that children with more severe multisystem inflammatory syndrome were making more of these antibodies. They had more of these antibodies. Now, that could indicate they had more severe infection, or it could indicate that they are having an exaggerated immunological response. Because we know when children get the multisystem inflammatory syndrome, it's no longer the virus itself that's there. That's being got rid of by the immune system. It's the body's inflammatory immunological reaction to the virus that's the problem. In severe multisystem inflammatory system of children, um, more often broadly elevated immunoglobulin response to a multitude of viruses. What the, so what they're seeing is this immunoglobulin G, that's the one that lasts for longer. So you make an immunoglobulin G, you make one type of immunoglobulin G to SARS coronavirus 2. But the immune system will make a different immunoglobulin G. It's still an immunoglobulin G, but it's a different one to, say, common cold virus. Or it'll make a different one to a, a corona common cold virus. Or it'll make a different one to uh, influenza. Or it'll make a different one to another common virus in children called respiratory syncytial virus. So they're all immunoglobulin type Gs, but they're all a bit different. They're all specific to a particular virus. So what this is saying is that the sickest children with the multisystem inflammatory syndrome had immunoglobulin type Gs to a multitude of respiratory viruses. And we'll list a few in a minute. So I hope you see what, what we're getting at here. So what we're saying is that the sickest children had recently had at, the, the sickest children with the multi system inflammatory syndrome of childhood of children they had a wider varieties of igg to a wider a wide variety of different viruses in other words they'd recently been exposed to several different viruses at the same time now if you have a lot of children in the same place all together there's always a lot of viruses floating around so if a child did get sars coronavirus 2 then they could be exposed to influenza or respiratory syncytial virus or a common cold virus at the same time. Meaning that the body has to fight several viral infections at the same time. Meaning they'll have to make several different types of immunoglobulin type G at the same time. Meaning the immune system will have to do much more work. 
Now, whether that's the cause of this systemic, this, this multi-system inflammatory system in children, we don't know. But what we do know is the children that were sickest did have more of these immunoglobulin type Gs. So that makes sense that getting several, two or more viral infections, two or several viral infections at the same time, could well increase the risk of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And of course, the more children that are around in a classroom, say, the more different viruses they'll bring to school that morning, the greater the possibility that any given child will get multiple viral infections at the same time. So I'm concerned about schools because of spreading the virus to families in the wider community. And, and I'm, I'm concerned because of the what may well be the increased chance of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children when lots of children mix together because of the possibility for multiple uh, simultaneous concurrent viral infections. So the antibodies they found specifically in these sicker children were other coronaviruses. Now the, these, these are the coronaviruses that cause the common cold. They're still coronaviruses but they, co they cause the common cold. The other one, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, was also found the immunoglobulins to that and to influenza and uh, the children the sickest children had the highest amounts of these immunoglobulin type G antibodies indicating multiple recent viral infections and uh, this is several weeks after possible SARS coronavirus 2 infection or exposure so by the time these children have this you test for the antigen and it's gone. The immune system's already got rid of it. It seems to be this inflammatory immunological reaction. So the multi-system inflammatory system in children presented more often with um, fever, nausea, nausea and vomiting. And interestingly, they mention rash now. So the rash in the United States seems to be associated with more severe disease, which hasn't been discussed in the UK. So that needs to be clarified. That needs to be clarified. But the viral load that in children that went on to develop multisystem inflammatory syndrome was the same as other infected children. So it wasn't that the multisystem inflammatory uh, the, the multisystem inflammatory <laughs> and let me get this right. The um Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. <laughs> Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. It, wa it wasn't that um, it was caused by a higher COVID-19 SARS coronavirus 2 viral load because the viral load in those was the same in other children. But it could have been caused by a variety of viruses at the same time. But interestingly noted, those features as being more common. Now, of course, that doesn't mean if a child has a fever, nausea, and vomiting, or a rash, they're going to get that. Of course not. They're just saying that was more common. Uh, the um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children uh, was less often associated with symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection. So that was less often associated with that. Now, the... Last thing I'm going to do in this video is the criteria that they use for multi-system uh, inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, because obviously this is a concern. So these features are likely to develop after a child has potentially fully recovered from the initial um, SARS coronavirus to infection itself. This is the body's response. So they're saying a fever of greater than 38 so what's 38? I don't know. Is it 100 and something? It's a high fever anyway. Um, a, a fever greater than 38 for greater than 24 hours. Someone will write in the comments what uh, 38 degrees centigrade is. It's a high, it's a high fever. Um, 37 degrees would be normal. Well, it's, it's a moderate, moderately high fever. So it's a raised temperature anyway. But it's for 24 hours. So it's 38 degrees centigrade for 24 hours. Plus they have to have laboratory evidence of inflammation. Now there's quite a few markers in the blood we can use to say, just a minute, there's some inflammation going on. There's quite a few of those. And there will be evidence for those because this is a multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So you would expect there to be uh, inflammatory markers, of course. At least two organs have to be involved, otherwise it's not uh, multi-system. 
it would be single system. In other words, the lungs and the heart or the lungs and the kidneys or indeed lungs, kidneys and heart could, could be involved. No alternative, uh, alternative diagnosis and a pos positive serological or antigen test. So you eliminate other things and you do diagnose it with the antigen or the antibody if the antigen has already been eradicated. There should be a history of exposure to an individual with COVID-19 within four weeks prior to the onset of symptoms. Although if you had a positive test, then I suppose that one could be bypassed. That, that, that's one to raise index of suspicion more, I would think. One that would indicate testing is appropriate. Now, this is concerning. It's known to have severe cardiac complications, including low blood pressure, low perfusion of the body tissue, shock, and potentially acute heart failure. So this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children is, is concerning. We have to stress it's very rare. But if a lot of children were infected all at the same time, and from this study, especially if there's other viruses going on around, then it's reasonable to assume it could become more prevalent. And the group conclude, the Massachusetts group conclude, understanding post-infectious immune response in paediatrics is critical for designing treatment and preventative strategies, which is a fairly self-obvious statement, but it's one they make. So just to conclude, um, children have the same or higher viral loads of adults. Children can spread the disease when they are asymptomatic. Children can spread the disease when they are mildly symptomatic. They're most infectious of the first two days. Children can take this to home to their families and spread it throughout the families. And if we don't account for this, this could be a significant driver of infection in this pandemic. OK, thank you for listening as always.